with all the extensions of motorways and the continuous development of the private car, Britain's railways survive to accept the challenge of a new age. The post-beaching era has seen faster speeds, electrification on a vast scale, and streamlined intercity services with trains that now race non-stop through abandoned stations. Once, little Bytham in Lincolnshire had a station of its own. No trains have stopped here since 1959. Yet for just one day, this sleepy country village, where not much happens even today, suddenly leapt into the news headlines. And a fascinating sign on a local inn recalls the event. This is on the old Great Northern Railway, about 100 miles from London. But today's high-speed trains race down the bank from Little Bytham to Essendine at 125 miles an hour. And yet amazingly, at this same spot, 50 years ago, a steam locomotive managed to chalk up the amazing speed of 126 miles an hour, and thus became, for all times, the world's fastest ever steam locomotive. It was named after a duck, Mallard. In the 1930s, the railway companies were in fierce competition for customers. And one way to ensure full trains was to create an image of reliability and speed. It was the London and North Eastern Railway who staged special stunts for the newsreels, like this one in 1932, about a race between a de Havilland Pussmoth, a speedboat, and LNER trains. It was filmed at Offord, alongside the River Ouse, History does not record who won. The locomotives that made these high-speed runs were built at Doncaster. It was here that the first engine to reach the officially authenticated speed of 100 miles an hour was built, Flying Scotsman. And it was here that Sir Nigel Gresley became chief mechanical engineer for the LNER in 1923. Now, with the LNER as one of the big four, he launched a program of engine design that captured the attention of the world's locomotive producers. Here at a special open day for his fellow engineers at Doncaster, Sir Nigel Gresley welcomes his guests as they pose for a photograph around one of Gresley's latest Pacific locomotives. In Britain, it became a key part of the race for speed against the rival London, Midland and Scottish Railway as well as claims from Germany, from France, and the United States. Gresley produced at Doncaster a series of experimental designs that paved the way for the future. In 1929 came number 10,000, Hush Hush, or the Flying Sausage, as the railwaymen called it. It was a monster with a high-pressure Yarrow marine boiler. It looked good, but it didn't work. In 1934, Gresley produced another experimental locomotive, Cock of the North, seen here on test at Vitry in France. These locomotives needed accurate testing, and this is the strange vehicle that did it, a dynamometer car, attached behind the locomotive and packed with instruments that recorded exactly what was happening on the footplate. This dynamometer car had been built for the old Northeastern Railway back in 1906. In 1935, Gresley was developing locomotives to make the test car really do its stuff, culminating in the A4 Pacific engine, first built at Doncaster Works to celebrate the Silver Jubilee of King George V and Queen Mary in 1935. In the last few years, the railwaymen have done a lot to make trains more comfortable and speedier than ever. Faster trains and still faster trains has been the cry, until here we have Britain's number one streamlined train gigantic, gleaming, and graceful. The dignity of this huge engine is in striking contrast to its puffing ancestors, which turned every journey into a very low commotion. Think of the generations of knowledge, skill, and experience behind the design and control of the Silver Jubilee, Britain's number one train. Over the next two years, a struggle for speed developed. 114 miles an hour by the LMS in 1937, 124 in Germany the same year. 
It was now up to the men of the LNER and their colleagues for Westinghouse brakes. After all, it was no good doing 126 miles an hour if you couldn't stop. I had been appointed in 1937 by Sir Nigel Gressley himself. He would always listen to what anybody had to say, and he was not above making use of anybody else's ideas or arrangement um, if it was suitable. Each Monday morning, I had to go and see Sir Nigel Gresley and tell him what had gone on. And when he wanted to put on a sort of quizzical expression, he lit his pipe and sort of turned to you with a half smile and he said, uh, when are you going for your next trials? So I said, well, 3rd of July, sir. He said, do you think we could go faster than the LM? So, of course, that led to a, a discussion as to what sort of train we were going to have and everything else. And, of course, we decided ultimately that we would have six cars of the Coronation instead of eight, plus the dynamometer car to record accurately the speeds and everything else. And as the Westinghouse people were involved, of course, they'd been on all the brake trials and it was decided that we would not tell the Westinghouse people that we were doing a brake trial with a reduced train and that we were going to try and beat the speed record. She was put in the depot with the train already uh, on Saturday night or something like that. And then we walked across the main lines, which would never be allowed now, uh, to pick up the train in the depot. Five o'clock in the morning, from Paddington to King's Cross, I had to walk. There wasn't a taxi to be found or a bus. We did about three stops going up to Grantham. And then we were going to do about three or four stops coming back. And of course, that was all kiboshed. And so the special train was quietly assembled and recorded only by the Kodak brownies of the men themselves who were taking part in this experiment. Even now, some of the men, including those in the dynamometer car, were unaware that a world record was at stake. We started off, and the Westinghouse, of course, got very suspicious, and they said, what's all this about? So, of course, in the end, we had to tell them. Driver Joe Duddington takes up the story. With my lovely blue streamlined engine Mallard, we drew away from Grantham. I accelerated up the bank to Stoke Summit and passed Stoke Box at 85. Once over the top, I gave Mallard her head and she just jumped to it like a life thing. Then, 108, 109, 110. Go on, old girl, I thought, we can do better than this. So I nursed her and shot through a little bathroom at 123. And in the next one and a quarter miles, the needle crept up further. 123 and a half, 124, 125. And then for a quarter of a mile, while they tell me the folks in the car held their breath, 126 miles per hour. 126, that was the fastest speed a steam locomotive had ever been driven in the world. They had done it. The world's fastest ever steam locomotive. But there was a price to pay for the big end on the front of the three-cylinder engine had failed and the train had to be stopped at Peterborough. Here the men posed for photographs on each other's cameras. The newsreel cameramen were waiting at King's Cross to greet the conquering hero. It never got there. So these amateur photos are all that was recorded on that great day. But when the dynamometer readings had been verified, the LNER released the story to press and newspapers throughout the world. Originally, it was 125 miles an hour, but a detailed examination later on led to a correction. When all the fuss was over, Mallard went back to work as part of the LNER day-to-day -day operations. Built as one of a second batch of A4 Pacifics in 1938, she joined Golden Eagle, Bitten, Kestrel, Kingfisher, and all the other birds. But then came the Second World War, and all the days of glory faded away. Mallard was even reduced to hauling good trains in wartime. The end of the Second World War 
found Mallard back as part of a team of steam engines pulling trains to Scotland on a daily basis. But now, only for a short while. The LNAR had gone, and it was British Railways, dedicated to a policy of diesel and electric trains. Mallard sported a weird new number, but was still around, often hauling special trains as post-war enthusiasts rediscovered her claim to fame. However, the days of steam really were over, and it was time for even a champion like Mallard to retire gracefully. Having travelled 1,426,000 miles, she was withdrawn from service in 1963. In 1975, she was towed behind a diesel to York, put on display at the then new National Railway Museum. From the world's oldest engines like Rocket to the world's fastest, here's where the old engines of the past come to rest in the vast shed that forms the central part of the National Railway Museum with its unique collection of relics of the past. Some two million people a year come here to see this superb repository of our recent past. Even the all-important dynamometer car that recorded Mallard's triumph is preserved at York. Well, there was no good telling people that you've done 126 miles an hour. You had to be able to prove it. And this is how you did it. It's called a dynamometer car, and this particular one was built by the Northeastern Railway as far back as 1906. It was still in use right up to 1951. And this is where it happened. Now, in fact, normally in here, the actual speed of the locomotive isn't strangely very important at all. This is recording things like the steam pressure and the amount of coal that's been used, the amount of water that's been consumed on the, on the trip, and what they used to call the drawbar tension, which is actually the power of the locomotive to pull a train behind it. But on that magic day in July, this piece of paper was racing through this gadget. These little magic fountain pens were pounding away, and it was on this machine that finally up came a series of little dots and scratches, which meant that that speed had been achieved. And there it was on the record. And here it is, the actual roll that went through this machine on that July day and recorded the record. And this is the moment when the record was broken. Now, rather interestingly, it actually says on it 125 miles an hour. But these charts had to be specially technically interpreted to get it all right and balance out the various factors. And so it was finally worked out that well, for 144 yards at any rate, the train went at 126 miles an hour. locomotive knew it was the star of the show, it must surely be Mallard. The story of its journey to York is told by Dr. John Coyley, keeper of the museum. Well, it came up uh, by rail from London, where it had been on show since it retired in 63 at the British uh, Transport Museum in Clapham. It was an obvious choice for them, the world's fastest steam locomotive. And when it was restored for them, uh, after finished uh, running on British rail, they did it up splendidly, but they obviously didn't expect it to steam again, as, uh, as we found. The workshops at York have restoration work for years ahead of them as they constantly update the collection and try to keep as much running as they can. For here there's a special policy. No good to see steam engines just static on the plinth. To understand them, you must see them live and breathe. And so every effort is made to put them into action wherever possible. The range of the collection is enormous an old wooden snowplough dating back to Victorian times. And those old platform ticket machines that were once so familiar with their polished brass handles and the names of the old railway companies prominently displayed 
and resplendent in the company colours. And a Nestle's, as we once called it, chocolate machine, which always seemed to work first time, most times. There are magnificent examples of royal carriages of the past, so that we can see how Queen Victoria travelled a hundred years ago. The travelling post office dates back to 1838. This was another British first, and the one at York has all the familiar fixtures and fittings, just like today. Even the now abandoned advanced passenger train has a place amongst the relics of the past. But Mallard is one of the most precious relics, still steaming to this day round those parts of the British railway system which will allow the use of steam engines. Rob Shawland Ball, deputy keeper of the museum, explains why she's so important. The future of Mallard is bound up with the future of the whole museum and our plans over the next four or five years include an expansion of our display space by more than 50 percent we shall be creating new and exciting interactive hands-on type displays in the peter allen building over the road from here building a new introductory gallery which we think is very important which will act as a sort of menu for visitors so that those who know little about railways will have a series of choices to follow through the introductory gallery and into the main displays this sort of enthusiasm has had its own rewards at York. When it was opened in September 1975, they estimated that they might get 250,000 visitors in the first year. In fact, they got 2 million. Since Mallard first got back into steam, the famous Flying Duck has made a series of outings, and each time the same ritual of starting up the engine must be gone through. It also provides a picture of the deputy keeper Shoveling coal. On a modern diesel or electric train, you climb into the cab, push a button, and away you go. It takes a minimum of about four hours to get a steam engine ready from coal. If you extend the time to 12 hours, so much the better. If you heat it up too quickly, the various metal parts expand at different rates. Before long, you get leaks and distortions of the metal surfaces. So you must warm it up gently, letting the whole engine expand slowly as the heat spreads from the furnace, through the tubes of the boiler, and on into the cylinders and valves. Only when the boiler pressure is correct, the engine is nicely warm throughout, will it perform properly, with no chance of damage. In the old days, steam raising, as it was called, was a drudge, a task given to the young trainee engine drivers who used to book on at sheds all over the country at two o'clock in the morning to get the engines ready for the men coming on duty at perhaps six or seven o'clock. Sam Foster, British Rail's boiler inspector, makes a final check on Mallard's front end. Today, getting a steam engine ready is an honour which only a privileged few are allowed to qualify for. The lads 50 years ago would have thought you were mad if you suggested steam raising just for fun. But Mallard today is a star who draws the crowds wherever she goes. When the lighting up process has been completed, the proud locomotive leaves her shed on the way to pick up her train. Today's trip is from Leeds to Scarborough. The crowds are out to give a super send-off to Mallow. Hauling a post office special to show off the work of the travelling post office and the issuing of a new set of stamps, the locomotive carries a special flag. The men on the footplate are ready for a brisk run, though not, I'm afraid, at 126 miles an hour. Mallard today is officially restricted to 60 miles an hour, Although the old loco men say she could still do that famous speed record figure if pushed, without the big end trouble that brought her to a sharp standstill at Peterborough after her great effort. From the air, the train looks like a supermodel layout. This is a living museum with a vengeance. Today, the other star turn is the travelling post office. 
system has hardly changed since it was first tried out on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway 150 years ago. Let us come in vast sacks into the travelling post office vans and as the train goes on its way, they're sorted into pigeonholes by town and city. Sorting of the letters while on the move creates a big saving in time which would otherwise be wasted in some office. Today, special first day covers have been issued to everyone on the train. Mine joins the system and is filed away to hopefully reach its destination. Mallard is on one of its favourite steam runs, heading from York towards the east coast and the sea. It all helps to create a holiday atmosphere, soon to be confirmed as we arrive at Scarborough, the town that contributed £35,000 towards the cost of the restoration of the great engine. All the cameras and videos are out to record the nameplate which tells the story of 1938. And all the enthusiasts for miles around come to pay tribute. Ironically, this post office trip was supposed to be a secret. But the word soon gets around. Mallard is coming. The local radio and press are there to greet us. Bye -bye. And to see us on our way home. What a day out it's been. Lovely old Pullman car coaches, a postal service on board the train, newly designed stamps to put on our cards and letters, and above all, the sight and sound of that great locomotive up in front, pounding its way past Kirkham Abbey and Castle Howard and Moulton and Napton on the smooth, flat sections between the Yorkshire Wolds and the North Yorkshire Moors, where Manor gets a chance to show why she was, and always will be, a champion amongst champions. Everyone seems to join in. The endless line of photographers at every vantage point the startled sheep and cattle who've seen and heard a thousand diesels but dash away in horror at the strange apparition of a steam engine. The railwayman reminiscing about the good old days. The young enthusiast to whom the sight and sound of steam is still a novel experience. Under nine, under nine, hundred and ten. And before I knew it, the needle was at hundred and sixteen. Go on, old girl, I thought we can do better than this. So I nursed her and shot to the little bathroom at 123. And in the next one and a quarter miles, the needle crept up further. 123 and a half, 124, 125. And then for a quarter of a mile, 126 miles per hour. 126, that was the fastest speed of steel locomotive had ever been driven in the world. Mechanically restored and resplendent in its original livery, Mallard is indeed a rhapsody in blue, racing through the countryside in the land where not only were railways invented, but where steam railways reached their highest peak of development half a century ago.